So, uh, we are now going to talk about one more uh, different thing which is uh, about GPU architectures. Right? I know many of you are probably waiting to hear about GPU architectures and CUDA and uh, my part of the lecture will primarily deal with the architecture. Lavanya would talk about CUDA programming. But these two are somewhat kind of uh, related to each other. So, I will in fact do talk a little bit about CUDA and the way things are in CUDA and how it kind of uh, gets executed in the architecture and so on and so forth. So, that is really what we are going to see uh, for now. I uh, will again start off with this uh, famous Moore's law and I will show you something. Before I go into the GPU architecture, I also want to take this opportunity now that you have seen uh, so many things uh, in this computer architecture course, I want to put some of these things in perspective and some of these things in perspective with reference to the Moore's law. Okay? So, we know that Moore's law states that the processor performance increases okay, by a factor of 2 every 18 months and that is really what you have seen. This is the curve that people generally show. Here is another curve which essentially plots various processors and that essentially shows the number of transistors have been doubling, how the number of transistors have been doubling okay, uh, for the last almost uh, 50 years or so. Correct? This is exactly what Moore said. Moore said that the number of device, number of transistors right in a chip is going to double every 18 months and that doubling of transistors essentially meant in processor architecture doubling of performance. But uh, if you see here, each one of them is a processor, okay? It, they are color coded because they are from different companies, okay? All right? So that is really what is uh, Moore's law and that is what we have seen. Now, on this plot, I would like to show how processor architects have innovated, taking advantage of this uh, increased number of transistors, right? So, that's, that's this slide over here. So, you see that uh, way back in the 70s started off with the first microprocessor, Intel's 4004 and later uh, towards, uh, you know, um, late 70s or early 80s, you have the first reduced instruction set computer coming in, okay? And that is what that gave a lot of emphasis to pipelining, okay? And deeper pipelining and so on. Then you have a set of uh, instruction level parallelism processors, some of which you have seen uh, in this uh, computer architecture school. So, you have seen a lot about uh, superscalar processors. You might have seen a little bit about very long instruction word processors and uh, EPIC is actually some combination of these things. And all of these processors essentially exploit what is called instruction level parallelism, right? Being able to execute fetch issue execute, right? Multiple instructions every cycle. That is really what we talked about. Then of course, we talked about multi cores, right? And you can see that that is what that happened somewhere during the middle of 2000 to 2010, right? So, in, in terms of time, that is when it happened. And then somewhere around 2007, you also saw that the um, number of transistors in a chip or a device has gone beyond 1 billion, right? So, you could see that the number of transistors is about 1 billion over here. And uh, the next innovation in uh, architecture is about accelerators, okay? These are what we call, what we call as throughput oriented processors, okay? Having a large number of cores capable of executing multiple instructions together and uh, the graphics processing unit is one such example. Okay? We are going to specifically talk about the GPUs in the context of general purpose computing, okay? not specifically for graphics purposes, although GPUs started off specifically for graphics purposes. We are going to more look at GPUs from the point of view of general purpose computing. So, I put accelerators way up there, okay? that happened somewhere post, that is at least GP, GPU activity started happening post 2005 and so on, right? So, this kind of gives you a nice overview of the architecture roadmap and how architects have uh, exploited, right, 
the number of transistors that were made available to them. Of course, on the way you will see that they have built multiple levels of cache hierarchies, they have done various things with regard to out of order instruction issue or superscalar processors, so on and so forth, which is what we have seen, right, uh, in various lectures in this last uh, one week or so, right. Okay. <coughs> so, when we talk about uh, uh, GPUs, uh, so just an introductory slide which basically says GPUs have become very popular, they give you a very high performance and uh, in order to program them, you are programming uh, things like CUDA, which is a programming language for this, OpenCL, which is another programming language which you can use to program them. Uh, this one I am not that familiar with. Uh, so these are all becoming available in order for you to exploit them. And the kind of performance that GPU gives is at least about an order of magnitude higher, right, than a CPU and a single threaded CPU. Okay, that's really what we are uh, talking about and we'll see where this performance is coming and what is the architecture of GPU and how we can exploit that, how we can make use of that. Okay, so here is uh, a quick uh, overview of a particular GPU architecture. This is somewhat old, this is the Fermi architecture. If you look at more recent architectures, they look somewhat similar but more number of uh, cores, more number of streaming multiprocessors and so on. So let's just uh, use uh, this particular thing for explaining things. So what you see here in this, any idea how many cores are there in this particular processor, Fermi? Anybody can guess? What does this diagram show? Which part of it is a core? The green parts are the core, but which green is the core? The entire thing is one core or many cores, how many cores? That is the question. Huh? 64 cores, good. Huh? Okay, so somebody who knows this thing says that there is 32 core within each one of these uh, rectangles, right? So each one of this rectangle is what is called an SM, right, streaming multiprocessor. And within that SM, if you look at it, there are 32 SIMD cores, right? And there are 8 SMs in this particular architecture, okay? If you look at a more modern um, GPU, like for example, uh, the Kepler 40 or the Kepler 80, you will have, so okay, in this particular architecture, you have a total of 512 SIMD cores. Whereas if you look at a Kepler architecture or something like that, you have a few thousand cores, right? If you look at the latest Pascal uh, or Volta architectures, you have roughly about, I think, 3,500 SIMD cores available on that. In addition, maybe there are some tensor processing cores also available, right? Let's not talk about what that is, but essentially you are talking about a few thousand cores which are being put together or grouped together in the form of multiple SMs, right? So each SM has 32 SIMD cores. It has an instruction cache, okay? It has a couple of schedulers which we will talk about, right? And then from the instruction scheduler, sorry, from the instruction cache, instructions are fetched and they are dispatched. You see that there is a register file here. This is a huge register file, okay? Again, we are talking about what is within an SM, please don't forget that. Every time we say this, you have to say, okay, this is within an SM, right? So typically, what is the size of the register file in the um, out of order issue processor that you saw? Size of the register file, roughly. Did, some, did we talk about register renaming to some extent? Yeah? So what is the size of the physical register file? Huh? We didn't say the number, but take a guess. Huh? Okay, how many registers are there? I mean, how many registers are there? I mean, logical registers are there? 32, right? 32 integer registers, 32 floating point registers. So now take a guess how many physical registers could have been there in an out of order issue processor? What would you think? Sorry? Only 32 only. Again, it depends on which kind of register renaming we are talking about. Let's assume 
you know a physical register based register renaming where the number of physical registers is much more than the number of logical registers. Huh? 128, right? 128, 256, whatever that is a number, it would not be more than that. Okay? Here we are talking about something like 16K, 64K registers, right? All right. And then uh, apart from this SIMD course, there are some number of load store units, some number of special function units. Okay? And then, of course, uh, you have a first level cache, L1 cache, okay, which is about 64K. This L1 cache can be split into some part as cache and some part as what they call as the shared memory. Okay? We are going to see all of these details uh, in some more levels of details in the next few slides, but it will be good to see this here because now what you are going to see is that this is in one SM. So each SM is basically a replication of that. Okay? And all of these SMs together share an L2 cache, which is typically in the order of few hundred kilobytes. So maybe about 780 kilobytes or something like that. Right? And then within this GPU, you see uh, these uh, DRAM controllers over there. Okay, that connects to the GRAM, DRAM uh, for the graphics uh, GPUs. There is something called a giga thread scheduler. Okay, we will again talk about this. This is responsible for scheduling what are called thread blocks onto these individual SMs. Okay, so this is essentially what is contained in a GPU. Right, you have SMs, each SM having multiple SIMD cores, right? And uh, each uh, SM also has some kind of an L1 cache, okay, and some kind of um, registers. And across all of these SMs, you have an L2 cache, which is being shared across these cores. So essentially, we are talking about a few thousand SIMD cores, right, in this device. Now, you should be ready to write program in today's afternoon lab, and so on session, right? to use these 2000 cores. Are you ready? Okay, we will see how we can do that, right? Okay, we talked about this L2 cache already. And uh, yes, we did talk about the gigathread scheduler also, okay? All right, the next few slides which I am going to uh, use, they are taken from this particular uh, talk, okay? Uh, you can actually make out whenever we present a nice slide with good graphics, right? They don't belong to us, <laughs> except possibly for somebody like Manu or uh, Biswa, who creates uh, or Arka, who creates these slides by themselves. Okay. So anyway, I, I just thought uh, I would acknowledge here uh, that the, the fact that these slides have been taken from somebody else. Okay. So before I go into GPU architectures and talk a lot about the things, let me actually quickly. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, CUDA programming. I'm going to actually talk uh, a little of CUDA programming every now and then because I need that concept in order for you to tell how my architecture is working. Okay? So essentially a CUDA program is actually a C plus CUDA program. Okay? The C program is going to run some piece of serial code okay? and this serial code is going to run on your host CPU, host processor. Right? Uh, by the way, all of you must be knowing that a GPU is not an independent entity by itself. It is always connected to the CPU, okay? And uh, as of now, right, the GPUs do not run an operating system by itself. So all of those activities have to happen from the host, which is the CPU. And then you execute some piece of serial code, right? So essentially, you are... Uh, coding for the GPU is going to be a combination of serial code followed by a kernel launch which is typically written in CUDA and then again a serial code which is in C and again another kernel launch which is in CUDA, right? Okay. Now, a little bit more details on the CUDA program. As I mentioned earlier, a CUDA program consists of several threads and each one of these threads does exactly the same work, okay? So yesterday we talked about SPMD program, right? Single program 
multiple data. And that's exactly what it is. They call it as single instruction multiple threads, SIMT. Okay, it's all the same. Right? Instead of program, it is instruction. Instead of data, they call it thread because each thread processes an independent data. Okay, so there are multiple threads and each one of this thread is going to be operating on one piece of data. Okay, so here are the thread IDs 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, dot, 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 dot. And if you see, using that thread ID, I am going to operate on some input program or some input array, right? I am going to do some processing and I am going to write into some output array, correct? That is essentially what you are going to do. So, it is essentially each thread is going to compute some element of an array and there are these multiple threads which are going to compute something, right? And you will identify each thread by a thread ID, okay? And again, we will see later on that that splits into multiple components and so on, and so on. right? For now, this simplified view would do, okay? So essentially, we have this set of multiple threads, okay? Some more things, right? It's not all that simple, okay? So it's more than that. So you have these multiple threads, many, 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 many threads which you are going to divide into what are called thread blocks, okay? How you divide depends on your program, depends on what you are, I mean, uh, how much of parallelism is there, how you want to put them into groups and so on and so forth, right? So essentially all of these threads are divided into multiple thread blocks. And within each thread block, there are a number of threads still, right? And they are going to be grouped in terms of what are called warps. I, oh, sorry, I was expecting that to happen. No wires. Okay, this animation is being skipped. So if you can actually see that, you could see those uh, rectangular boxes, right? Which essentially says that um, all the threads within a thread block are divided in terms of what are called warps. A warp is essentially a contiguous set of 32 threads, right? So we need to remember and understand all of these uh, terminologies because they are going to be useful for us to discuss the next few things, right? So what, what all have we seen so far? We have seen threads, we have seen thread blocks, and we have seen warps. Any questions? Number of what? Number of threads? Number of thread blocks, okay. Uh -huh. It depends, okay. So the number of threads depends on the parallelism. How you group them into thread blocks depends on what your problem is about, okay. It's, it's more, okay. So there is some restriction in the sense that uh, a thread block can contain at most I think 15, 36 threads in certain versions and some people, I mean, certain other version it is 1024. So roughly let's say about 1024 to 15. You can just keep it as one thread block. Okay, but I will tell you, I will tell you what is going to happen if you have it as one thread block. Okay, just hold on for a second, right? Uh, so essentially, we are going to assume that I have a very large number of threads, okay? There are two reasons why I want to group them in terms of thread block. Good that you brought up this point. There are two reasons why I want to group them in terms of thread block. One reason is that there is a limitation from the CUDA side which basically says that there cannot be more than 1536 threads per thread block. Okay, so if you have more than 15, 36 threads per thread block, divide them into multiple thread blocks. That's one reason. The second reason, so you will say, why are you constraining me? I would actually love to have everything as a single thread block. Why don't you change CUDA to allow me to have 1 million threads in a single thread block? You could ask me that question, right? There is a second reason, which is actually a performance advantage that we are going to talk about, which we'll talk about in a subsequent slide. Okay, so wait until that. Any, any other question? Yeah, uh, one here and then I'll come over there, yeah. Uh, 
Very good, very good point. You already answered the question. Let's just look at it, right? Wait until we look at it, yeah. So the complexity of each individual core is much, much smaller than the complexity of one out of order core, which we're going to talk about, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's not compare open MP MPA in this discussion now. If I, if you want, I can take it offline. Okay, uh, right? The two different uh, things. So let's let's talk about it. All. Okay. All right. So let me go back to my slide mode, and hopefully the remaining things will work. So this is the same thing that we saw so far. Right, a program consists of multiple kernels. Each kernel consists of a set of thread blocks, okay? And for some reason, these thread blocks are going to be arranged as a two-dimensional or a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional array of thread blocks. Maybe this is how your program maps to thread blocks, right? For example, if I have, let's say, a large two-dimensional array, right? Maybe I will try to divide this in terms of tiles and each tile might be mapping to one thread block one, and therefore you have this as an array of thread blocks or a two dimensional array of thread blocks, right? That's essentially what it is. If you don't like anything, you just assume that it's a linear thread block, no big deal. Sometimes this will be helpful because you can map this uh, first index and second index to some parts of the tiles first index and second index. Maybe that's the reason, right? So again, that's why I say that how you group them in terms of thread block actually goes back to your application, right? That's really what's happened, okay? All right, so each one of these thread blocks themselves uh, consists of, uh, okay, let's see that first. Each one of these thread blocks essentially consists of multiple threads. Again, these threads can be organized as one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional, right, structures. Right? Essentially, you are saying that instead of saying that I have 1024 uh, threads in a thread block, I can say I have 32 cross 32 threads in my thread block. Right? I mean, so it's a two-dimensional array of 32 cross 32. Right? Or you can split it as a three-dimensional thing, okay, which says 2 cross 16 cross 32. No big deal. Right? So in the first dimension, you have 2, in the second dimension, you have 16, and in the third dimension, you have 32. But essentially, you have 1024 threads, right? And these dimensions essentially bring in some indices, which I will show you in a later slide, and how those indices help to identify the thread ID. So if I have, let's say, a 32 cross 32, right, that is I index and J index, so the thread ID will be a combination of I index and J index. Similarly, for the thread block, it's a two-dimensional array, so there is an X index and a Y index, right? And those X index and Y index together tells you which thread block it is, right? That's, that's all it's about. And uh, Lavanya would talk about uh, CUDA programming, where she will say what these things are and how they map to something. Why is the thread ID important? Eventually, the thread ID is the one which is going to determine which element for which you are going to do the computation, correct? Right, because you saw in the earlier diagram that I'm going to operate on input of thread ID, output of thread ID. So I'm going to operate on that particular element. So essentially, I need to find out what is this thread responsible for. This thread is responsible for modifying that particular grid point. And how, what particular grid point that is determined based on its thread index, sorry, on its, yeah, on its thread uh, IJ index and maybe on its thread block index, which is XY index, right? That's all it is about, okay? Yeah. Something like that. Yes. Okay, don't worry about that. It, it may not really matter. Okay, you are asking whether it is row major or column major, is it? I, I don't think that matters, okay? All right, so uh, one other point that we want to talk about and we will again emphasize this point is that all the threads within a thread block, right, they are a group of 
work, right? And uh, they can synchronize their execution. So, if you want to have some synchronization between those threads, you can actually do that by means of using some synchronization primitives. And they can also efficiently share some data in the shared memory that you saw. Remember, we saw some piece of shared memory and L1 cache within an SM, right? So, that is a place where all of these threads which are in this thread block, so here thread block uh, whatever it is 1 1, right? That thread block whatever threads which are there, they can share some common data in the shared memory, okay? So, that is that is one other reason why you want to group threads together because together they can do synchronization and together they can share some shared memory. Of course, threads in this thread block and threads in that thread block, right? Doing synchronization across them is at this point I will say difficult. You have to do, uh, you have to do it only across let us say kernel invocations, right? And they cannot share any memory other than through global memory and there is no guarantee on how they would share this, okay? So, essentially the advantage is that threads within a thread block can do synchronization across them and they could also share data across them. That is the advantage of grouping threads into a thread block, okay? Now, let us come to very, very quickly on CUDA program, right? So, this is the sequential program where I am doing what I call as the SACSPY code which is basically computing A of X of I plus Y of I, right? And uh, writing the result back into Y of I. This is a simple piece of uh, code, right? And this code is executed on all the elements of this array and let us assume N is very large, maybe 1 million, okay? Now, if you have this piece of code, you can actually write a CUDA program for that and execute it on the GPU. Right? What you do? You do some kind of a kernel launch and the kernel will actually look like this. This XPY parallel kernel would look like this. Right? I have not shown the kernel launch code. Uh, yeah, I have. Okay. So, this is, this is the kernel launch code. Right? And uh, let us not worry about, okay, we, we will talk about it. Right? So, So, this code essentially says invoke the SACSPY kernel with um, 256 threads per thread block and the number of blocks is essentially the number of elements divided by 256, right? This plus 255 is basically taking the uh, seal function, okay? So, this is the seal function that we are talking about. So, it essentially says the number of, so, so if you look at it, the number of thread blocks multiplied by the number of threads in a thread block is the total number of elements that you have, right? So, here we are basically using a one dimensional, uh, one dimensional uh, grid, okay? And there are, so let us assume that, uh, okay. So, let us assume if there are 64K elements, right? If there are 64K elements in the array, right? Then 64K divided by 256 is again 256. Right, so you will you will say that there are 256 thread blocks, each thread block having 256 threads. That's really what you are saying. Yeah. What is the n? Huh? Yeah, n is the number of elements in the array. Look at it. Okay, n is the number of elements in the array. Okay. Now, when you correct me if I'm making any mistakes in any of these things. So, essentially you are talking about the number of thread blocks being launched, okay, and the number of threads in that thread block, okay, that is being specified and n is an input parameter and uh, these are other input parameters, this corresponds to probably the constant A that you are using and uh, this corresponds to the X and Y arrays that you are using in your program, okay. So, before you do this, you probably have to do some CUDA mem copy and other things which we will talk about it later, let us not worry about it. So, this essentially launches the kernel on the GPU and the execution in the GPU essentially what it does is that it computes, okay, what is the element for which I am responsible for and that is essentially specified by my thread block ID multiplied by my block dimension which is 256 in this case 
plus my thread id okay, which is my current thread id number and all of these things put together tells me which element I am supposed to work on. So, for example, if I say that the thread blocks go from 0, 1, 2, 3 and the threads go from 0, 1, 2, 3 up to 256, then the first thread block would be for threads from 256, 257, 258 and so on and depending on which thread you are talking about, they will be operating on that particular element. Okay? So, essentially this computes which right element you are going to be working on and that is really what you are going to do, right? simple. So, all these let us assume 1024 threads or 6048 threads essentially that you are going to have do exactly the same computation which is basically computing the value for one element of the array and writing it back, right? that is as simple as that. But how does this get executed on the GPU architecture is what we want to see. Keep this, keep this uh, figure in mind when we talk about other things. Okay? Any questions? You will see more of CUDA programming and all of those things little later, so we will not get into that. Again the same diagram that we have seen earlier, so we will skip this. Okay? Oh, maybe now it is a good time to look at some of those things. So I mentioned, right? So, these thread blocks are going to get executed. Each thread block would go to one of these S sums, right? And within that S sum, each thread block itself has multiple threads. So, they are going to be divided in terms of warps, right? And one warp will execute at a time. Each warp is how many threads? 32. How does that 32 come from? Number of SIMD cores, right? So, those 32 threads in a warp will execute together. They will execute one of those instructions. And when they execute one of those instructions, it is the same instruction which is being executed by all of these cores, but on different data elements. Okay? That is why it is called SIMD cores, right? single instruction, multiple data. Right? Okay. All of those threads within a thread block can share some shared memory, so you can see that, right? What else? All of those threads in a thread block, okay, will have their registers in that register file, some parts of the register file. Okay, we will see more things as we go by. Uh, let me not talk about everything here. Okay, so this is what is inside what is called a streaming multiprocessor. Inside a streaming multiprocessor, we have 32 CUDA cores or SIMD cores, okay, and these corresponds to th these can do 32 floating point operation, single precision floating point operation in a cycle, or it can do 16 double precision floating point operation in a cycle. This is an older version of the processor, okay, but anyway, I think these numbers probably may not change much or they can do 32 integer operations in a single clock cycle. That is essentially what it can do. Um, it also has 16 uh, load store units. That means that in a given cycle, it can perform 16 load store operations. Right? Um, all right. It has four special function unit, which is shown separately. And it has a 64 kilobyte of shared memory plus L2 cache. And uh, this shared memory plus L2 cache can be organized as some part of it as shared memory and some part of it as a L1 cache. For example, you could have 32 KB of L1 cache and 32 KB of shared memory or 16 KB of shared memory and 48 KB of L1 cache or the other way around, right? 16 KB of L1 cache and 48 KB of shared memory and whichever way the application wants to use it, they can use it. Yeah. Shared memory will be shared by all the threads which are executing on this system. L1 cache is also shared by all the threads within an system. Okay. So, so very, very quickly, uh, have you people seen what is called a scratch pad memory? Have you, have you come across the word scratch pad memory anywhere? No. Okay. So, in the case of a cache, what happens is that the data is brought in by the hardware as and when you need it. 
okay, and it will be thrown away as and when something else comes in. You do not have a control on what data will remain in the cache. Whereas, in a scratch pad or a shared memory, you can specifically say I want to bring this data into my shared memory and unless you as a programmer throw it out, it will be there in your shared memory. Okay, so, it is programmer or user controlled kind of a cache. right? All people also call it as a software cache. Okay, so, there is some flexibility in terms of okay, how you want to use this. And in this particular processor as I mentioned earlier, there are 32 K 32 bit registers, significantly large number of registers than what you saw in the case of an out of order processor. But the processor core itself I think that comes in the next diagram, okay, I think I am just going over each one of them. Yeah, the processor core itself is a very simple processor, it has a dispatch unit because individual cores do not have to do instruction fetch and decode, why? Huh? That is done by the CPU, no. Huh? Somebody is, uh, can you just talk a little louder, sorry. All are going to execute same instruction and if you see here in the previous slide, you would have seen that there is a common instruction fetch for that. So, that does the instruction fetch, not the CPU, right. Within the GPU, within an SM, there is an instruction fetch. That does the instruction fetch from the instruction cache and does the decode, right. And here you essentially try to dispatch ready instruction to the functional units. It is a very simplified form of an in order code, okay, in order, uh, in order instruction issue. And uh, only when the instruction is ready to execute, that means that its operands are available, it can be issued, right. If the operands are not available, it will wait, right. You have seen that in the case of um, both in order and out of order issue, right, there is this notion of scoreboarding. I think scoreboarding was done in detail, right? No? How, how would you figure out which instruction can be issued? Was that done in the pipe? No? Okay, does not matter. So, uh, you will go back and you can read little bit about scoreboarding. That is a basic thing for doing out of order issue, right? <coughs> All right. Uh, I, I will talk very, I mean I will talk a little bit about it little later. Uh, so, what happens here is that this is an in order issue. So, if the instruction is ready to go, then that can be issued either to the integer unit or to the floating point unit depending on what type of instruction it is. If it is a load store unit, it will go to the load store pipeline and it will get executed. But if the instruction is not ready, right, unlike in the case of your CPU core, single CPU core where you wait for the instruction to become ready, here what you do is that you will switch to a different warp because now you have multiple warps which are available within an SM, right. Because all, all that, that we are talking about is 32 instructions that corresponds to one warp. Let us say if the instructions in a warp are not ready to execute, their operands are not available, do not worry about that warp, let us go to somebody else. Why? because remember you have a large number of threads and that means that you have at least that number of threads divided by 32 number of warps. So, if I take my previous example where I said my thread block contains 1024 threads, then within that thread block I have 32 warps available to me. So, if one warp is stalling because its data operands are not available, okay, let it wait, no hurry, let us go to the other warp, right. So, in the next cycle of, that is in, in each cycle, right, you will actually pick an instruction from a warp that is ready to execute. And you can do this context switching almost every cycle, right. And all the warps of a thread block essentially occupy resources within the SM, right. Now, you go back and look at it. Why do we have a large register file? Because I want to hold a large number of warps in an SM, right. Each thread let us say may require something like 8 registers, then 32 threads in a warp would require 
256 registers and 1024 threads would require 8K registers. So one thread block might require 8K registers and I will hold all of them together at the same time in my register file. So if this warp is stalling because some data is not available for it to execute, I can switch to some other warp and all those things would be available in it. So I will have the context for multiple warps available in my SM. And across all the SMs, even more number of warps and more number of thread blocks. Correct? All right. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the memory hierarchy before we go into the actual execution. Right? So threads again can store their operands in registers. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a large register file. So for example, you can think in terms of a thread requiring something like uh, 8 registers or 32 registers, whatever number it is. Right? So if you have a thread block containing, let's say, 1024 um, threads and each thread requiring 32 registers, then across all of these threads you would use the entire register file. Okay? Or if you say that your threads require something like 16 registers, then a total of 16K registers out of the 32K is what you would use. Right? That's the first level. Then all the threads can also access what is called a local memory. Okay? Uh, and the block of threads, that is the threads within a thread block can also use the shared memory. Okay? Local memory by itself is not a separate memory, okay? but it, it, it's called local memory. It's a part of the device memory, right? That, that's what it is. Okay. Now, um, the threads in a thread block can also share the shared memory. In addition to this, there are something called a texture memory also. Okay? That's something that you can use, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay. So the, the levels are like this. You can access your registers within a cycle. Okay? You can access the local memory, but this, uh, that's not, uh, I, I'm not very aware of how much time it takes. It should be, again, in the order of uh, whatever is the device memory time. Uh, whereas this shared memory could be like accessing your cache. Okay? That's basically what it is. And in the next level of your hierarchy, it is the global memory. Okay, which is what we call as the device memory. Typically, this is the GDDD or RAM that you will talk about. Right? And this has a large access time. You can see that the latency of this is a few hundred cycles, 400 cycles or so on. Right? And uh, the nice thing about this is that it, at the same time, while the latency is very high, the bandwidth it provides is very large it's because it has a very wide channel. Right, bus width. Okay, uh, that's something which is uh, good about it. Okay, um, what else do I want to say? So now you can see that my threads are here. They could access my registers or they could access my shared memory. Okay, and uh, the way that to look at it is that this group of threads is probably a thread block, and all of these thread blocks can access the global memory. All of the threads in the thread blocks can access the global memory, but uh, the consistency of memory is something that one needs to worry about. Okay? So uh, you will talk about it a little bit, or at least give them the caution that this is what they can assume. Right? All right. Um, so, so what happens uh, in CUDA is that when a thread is executing, right, the threads within a thread block can assume that any read write that they do can be seen by the other threads provided they go through the shared memory. But if one thread writes something into the global memory and another thread from a different warp wants to read that memory, there is no guarantee that they will be able to see that value. Right? That may may not necessarily happen. Right? Uh, it is actually more in the context of thread blocks rather than threads within a thread block, but uh, one needs to be careful about it. Okay? Um, I, think, I think threads within a thread block would still see. Right? Sorry, global memory? Yeah. 
you can access, but there is no consistency. There is no consistency in that. That is because, um, yeah, that, that's because okay, Arka is also here. He can also add to that. Um, there is no guaranteed ordering in which thread blocks will execute in the first place. And there is no guaranteed ordering in which the warps will also execute. So essentially speaking, what happens is that if these thread, a set of threads belong to one warp and they do some writes, and these threads, uh, these set of threads which are in the other warp wants to read that, right? There is no guarantee which warp will execute when. And therefore, you can't really ensure, unless you, of course, you can actually put some synchronization and ensure that. Unless you do that, you can't necessarily understand you know, what will execute when. So, so those issues have to be handled somewhat carefully, right? And when it goes across thread blocks, there is no guarantee either, okay? Because you can't even do synchronization, okay? So that's really what we need to remember from this slide, okay? Uh, we have again talked about uh, these issues uh, on uh, the access time, okay? Okay, there is one other thing that I want to talk about, maybe go back to the previous slide. So we talked about this large bandwidth, right, and the ability to access a large number of, uh, large amount of data from the global memory to the CP, uh, to the GPU cores or the SIMD cores, right? That essentially means one other thing, whether your accesses are going to be coalesced or not. Okay, so let's talk about it in this way. So let's assume a group of warps, maybe 32 in threads in a warp, right? Not, not a group of warps, a group of threads in a warp, try to do a load operation, right? So let's say that uh, thread zero to thread 31 are trying to do a load operation, right? Each one will correspond to one of those elements in the array. So they correspond to array element zero, array element one, et cetera, up to array element 31, right? And typically, these will be this will be in the memory arranged in the linear order, in the consecutive memory locations. Correct? So first you will have the array location zero, then the array location one, two, three, so far. If it's let's say each one of these elements is a four byte data, then this would correspond to 128 bytes of contiguous data. Correct? Remember that the threads essentially execute one thread is corresponds to one element. So if your computation is nice, so remember again the Saxby PUI computation. Each one is doing X of I, right? So thread zero is doing X of I, thread one is doing X of one, thread two is doing X of two and so on. And these will be linearly arranged in the memory, right? If these are linearly arranged in the memory and if all of them are trying to do a load operation and let's say this data is not available in your L1 or L2 cache and when that request comes, it's actually fetching something like 128 bytes of data, correct? And this 128 bytes of data can be fetched as much as parallel because your bus is quite wide. And that is why you are getting that large bandwidth, okay? So if you can kind of make sure that these accesses are somewhat coalesced, that they correspond to consecutive locations, and that coalesced access is what is given to the memory, then you can essentially exploit very large bandwidth out of this. That's really how it works. So internally, the processor has a mechanism, the SIMD cores, right, when they issue a memory load request, right, internally they are tried, I mean, you try to coalesce them in some way and then try to fetch the data from that. That's really what would happen. That's essentially what this slide is talking about. Okay, I will not go into the exact details of 64 bytes, 128 bytes, etc. Okay, again, it varies from one generation of GPU to the next generation of GPU. And uh, again, uh, we don't have to necessarily pay attention to that particular value. Okay, so again, this goes into a specific thing and then says that when these 32 um, accesses are there, are they going to fetch things together? Correct? And uh, in what cases they will be able to fetch things together in a single fetch or maybe take multiple fetches and things like that. So this diagram essentially explains what's happening here. Even though I said each thread is supposed to work on a particular thread ID and a particular thread number, in the case of SACS-PY, it is very straightforward, right? So everything will work on 
consecutive elements and you will be able to fetch. Supposing let us say you write a program in which you have written a of x of i something like this. correct? Then what happens? Let us say this i right are consecutive threads, but what about a of x of i are they consecutive? Need not have to be right, because that depends on the values in the array x. If the values in the array x are permuted in some other way right, then a of x of i would correspond to some random locations in that array because see for example, x of 0 could be 5, x of 1 could be 7, x of 2 could be 3, then a of x of i would be the 7th element, the 10th element and the 3rd element, right and they are not consecutive, correct. So, that could happen. In fact, there is no reason that they have to be nearby each other also. For example, x of 1 could be 1024 and x of 2 could be 2 they can be far apart also, because that depends on what is stored in this array, right. So, if it so happens that there is a load which corresponds to this axis comes, then even though your threads are consecutive, even though your thread IDs are consecutive, the data elements that you are trying to access may not necessarily be consecutive. So, it might happen that in a fortunate case, I will have them nearby. In fact, all of these things correspond to accessing elements okay, within that 64 bytes, but permuted. Right? Even if this happens, okay, the GPU, uh, the, the, the CUDA cores right, and the streaming multiprocessor would be able to coalesce this and make it as a single access. A okay? uh, couple of more diagrams, I will not go into this, but then here what happens is that it goes beyond the 64 byte boundary, then it might split into two accesses. Okay? But if it is across multiple 64 bytes, then each one would correspond to one of those accesses. So, internally the processor or the streaming multiprocessor would be able to coalesce this as much as possible to fetch it in terms of 64 byte chunk. Okay, and then give it to the processor and only the required data would be used. So, it is beneficial if all the 64 bytes are used that is when you will maximally utilize the bandwidth and if only some parts of it is used then your benefits go down. Yes. Internally, yes, internally and the GPU already does that. So, that kind of a rearrangement to do right would take uh, maybe a few maybe less than 10 cycles. The memory access itself is 400 cycles right and if you do not do that you will incur multiple such 100 cycles right. So, definitely beneficial to do the rearrangement, even it takes few tens of cycles, is not it? All right, that, that is where the benefits come from. Okay, let us let us skip the other one, which is again one more level of detail. Okay, let us go to thread block scheduling. Right? So, I have already assumed that I am going to divide my program, my, my program is many, many threads, I am going to divide them in terms of thread blocks right and we said that the giga thread scheduler is going to schedule these thread blocks across different s sums okay so the first point about why many s sums the person who has asked the question is not here but anyway i will answer it uh, if i have only one th so so what's really going to happen is that the giga thread scheduler is going to assign thread blocks okay to s sums so an entire thread block has to be assigned to one s sum, you cannot split it, that is the granularity of assignment. You take the entire thread block and then you can assign it to one s sum. Multiple thread blocks can be assigned to the same s sum, but one thread block cannot be split across multiple s sums. Okay. So, if I have a program which contains only one thread block, then what happens? <coughs> 
Huh? Louder. One SM will execute it, that is fine, but what happens? What about the other SMs? They will be idling, right? That's not what you want. You have many, many threads, right? But you have grouped all of them into one thread block. So you said all the work goes to one SM while the other SMs are sitting idle. So you don't want that situation, and that's why you need to also divide your threads into multiple thread blocks, right? And that's that's, that kind of justifies the CUDA putting the constraint saying that you can't have more than 1024 threads in a thread block or 1536 threads in a thread block, right? A constraint also relates to various, a few other things, but uh, we will not get into all of those details, okay? So that is the reason why you want to divide your threads into thread blocks. You want to make use of as many SMs as possible. So the giga thread scheduler is going to assign these SMs to multiple, uh, sorry, each one of those thread blocks to one of these SMs, and it may assign multiple thread blocks to multiple SMs. So in this particular case, I have eight thread blocks, and if I have two SMs, maybe it would assign, right, four thread blocks to each one of them. If I have only four SMs in a particular device, sorry, if I have four SMs in a particular device, then possibly I can assign two, two thread blocks to each one of them so that they all have equal amount of work and they all can try to finish the same thing, right? Okay, so we are discussing about how the thread blocks get scheduled onto the streaming multiprocessors and the advantage of splitting a single task into multiple thread blocks so that many of these systems can be working together, right? Now, uh, if you ask the question, how many thread blocks? can go into an SM. For example, in this case, right, I had eight thread blocks and I evenly divided it. What if, if I had, let's say, 256 thread blocks? Can I divide it evenly and then put 64 thread blocks per uh, SM, right? That's the question, right? But what happens is that um, the number of thread blocks that can simultaneously reside in an SM is actually limited by some parameters, okay? And we will talk about that perhaps in the next slide, okay? How many uh, thread blocks can be simultaneously residing in an SM? But uh, again, try to uh, reiterate some of these points that the threads in a thread block can cooperate using load store, okay? From memory, they can actually share through shared, uh, sh uh, shared memory and they can synchronize with each other. and. The important thing to remember here is that the gigabit, uh, the giga thread scheduler is going to schedule these thread blocks in these SMs in one particular way or the other, and there is no guarantee that a particular thread block will complete its execution before the other, even whether it is within an SM or across SMs. So here I cannot say that thread block 0 will complete its execution before thread block 5, I cannot say that they will execute in any order. It may be possible that thread block 5 in one iteration, in one round of execution would finish first and in another round of execution, thread block 3 may finish first. So there is no guarantee. So all that, that the programmer has to assume is that they will execute in any order, right? The only thing that is guaranteed is that instructions within a thread are going to be executed sequentially. And all of these threads are going to be executed in parallel in any order, right? That's really what you need to assume. And if you want to do some level of synchronization, you can do synchronization of threads within a thread block, but not across thread blocks, right? You can't do synchronization across thread blocks. The way in which you do that is basically to end the kernel and then start a new kernel. That's the only way by which you will do synchronization across thread blocks, at least for now, okay? Is that clear? Okay. So resident thread block, this is what we said, how many threads, sorry, how many thread blocks can go into a single GPU or can concurrently reside in a single GPU? This is decided by four parameters. One is there is a, a cap that is being put by the GPU itself. So here they say that in the case of Fermi, they say that there can be at most eight thread blocks that can reside concurrently. That's a maximum. You can't do anything more than that in Fermi, right? 
and also they say that there is a maximum number of threads that can be supported in a SM. Okay, I do not remember the number on top of my head, but typically these two are kind of together tied to something. Okay, but anyway, let us not worry about the exact numbers. The third thing is that I told you the threads in a thread block right, could be using the registers from the register file right, and all of these registers are allocated to these threads and therefore, if I have 8 thread blocks that are concurrently residing in an SM, then for all of them and for all the threads of those thread blocks, we must be able to allocate registers right. That means that the registers used per thread multiplied by the number of threads multiplied by the number of blocks that many registers is what I need should not exceed my register file capacity correct. So, the number of thread blocks that I can have as concurrently resident okay, is limited to the is limited based on this right. For example, if each thread block requires let us say 10 k registers right, if each thread block requires 10 k registers and I have a 32 k register file, then obviously, I can only hold 3 thread blocks correct. So, the minimum of all of these things is essentially what is going to be the number of resident thread blocks. Similarly, I told you each thread block shares I mean uh, the threads in a thread block can access the shared memory. So, this shared memory has to be allocated this is like a software cache. So, each thread block is allocated certain size of shared memory right. If I allocate let us say again um, 12 k of shared memory per thread block and let us say I have 42 k of shared memory then at most 4 thread blocks can be there resident at a given time. So, you take all of these numbers and whichever one is the constraining one that is essentially what is going to determine the number of thread blocks of that particular kernel. So, it is again kernel specific right for that kernel only that many thread blocks can be resident concurrently in an SM right. So, for example, I have written my matrix multiplication program and for that matrix multiplication program the register constraint says that I can only have um, a maximum of 3 thread blocks and my shared memory constraint says I can have a maximum of let us say 5 thread blocks and uh, let us say these two are saying that you can have up to 8 thread blocks. Then for that matrix multiplication kernel you would say that we can only have 3 concurrent thread blocks in a SM right you understood that. Whereas, you go and write your SACS PY program that number may be different, but in no case the number can be greater than 8 because this is a device specific max. Okay. So, if you have now 256 thread blocks okay, depending on what your number is let us say if your number is 3, 3 is the maximum number of thread blocks that can reside concurrently in an SM then what and let us say you have 16 SMs then what the gigabit uh, sorry giga thread scheduler does is basically allocates 3 thread blocks per SM and allocates the first 48 thread blocks to these SMs. And then say after you finish your thread block, you come and ask me, I will assign more threads one at a time. Okay. So, out of the 256 thread blocks, the first 48 thread blocks would be assigned to these different SMs, maybe 3 per SM, because that is the maximum number of thread blocks that can be resident together for that particular kernel and they are being assigned. Okay. And the <coughs> threads in those 3 thread blocks will execute in an SM. Let us see how that is going to happen next. Okay. So, is this clear? The remaining thread blocks will be allocated one at a time as and when these thread blocks finish in their respective SMs. So, as soon as let us say thread block 4 finishes in let us say SM 2 then that SM will be allocated one more thread block. Let us say thread block 10 finishes in SM 15 it will be allocated one more thread block making sure at any point in time no more than 3 thread blocks are resident in that particular SM that is how it is being done right. And the reason for doing that is that these are the physical resources that are required for holding that thread block and unless you have those physical resources you cannot schedule those threads uh, thread blocks in that SM that is the reason. Okay. <coughs> now, 
we said that there are three thread blocks in this particular example that are resident in an S sum. And let us say each one of these thread blocks consists of 8 warps or 256 threads, right. So, out of these three thread blocks, I have a total of 24 warps. So, all of these warps, okay, are also called resident warps, okay, and they are going to execute in that S sum. And whenever you have a latency, whenever you have a stall, you are going to switch between these warps, right. That is essentially what you are going to do. I will show that in the next slide, okay. So, that is essentially warp scheduling. At every cycle, you find out which one of the warp has an instruction which is ready to execute. That means, has its data operands available. And if there are multiple such uh, warps that have data operands ready, you pick one of them based on some other condition, maybe the oldest one first or the one which has the lowest warp ID number, whatever it is. You can do that and then you will schedule that instruction. Again in the next cycle, right, you will go and find out who has a ready instruction and you can schedule that warp. In the next cycle, you do that. Let us say a warp issues a load instruction and that load instruction does not find the data in the cache. It is going to take 400 cycles, right. Then that warp will not become ready for 400 cycles. The remaining warps, if they have ready instructions, they will be executed during that 400 cycle. Right. Let us say one of those warps again issue another memory instruction that is going to be stalling for another 400 cycles. Like that it is going to happen. So, essentially what happens is that at each cycle you pick an instruction from the warp and you keep executing it. And the instruction from the warp corresponds to how many threads? 32 threads. So, in every cycle you will try to execute 32 threads, up to 32 threads. Right. And in the next cycle you may possibly take instruction from another warp. So, essentially this is showing here that in the first cycle you have executed instruction 11 from warp 8, right. In the next cycle you have gone to instruction 42 from warp 1. In the next cycle warp 3 instruction 95, warp 8 instruction 12. So, what you assume here is that between this time to this time, okay, warp 8 has progressed by one instruction and warp 12 either had an instruction which is not dependent on 11 or the dependency has already been satisfied within these three cycles, right. Because otherwise this instruction cannot execute, is not it? If it has a dependency on instruction 11 and if instruction 11 has not completed, this would not have been ready. So, that is essentially what the warp scheduler does. Uh, there is a complication that there are two warp schedulers in Fermi and they schedule half of a warp in 16 SMs and things, sorry, 16 SIMD cores and things like that. Let us not get into that. So, from our perspective, what we need to understand is that on a cycle by cycle, right, the uh, SM can switch from one warp to the other warp to the other warp to the other warp, okay. Now, what is the advantage that you are getting by doing the switching between these warps? right. I already mentioned about it. What is the advantage? Huh? You do not stall. What is the advantage? Right. Your stalls, okay, you do not stall. That essentially <coughs> it is whenever there is a latency, you are kind of switching to another warp and you are executing instructions from that. So, this latency that the instruction is incurring is being masked by other useful work. That is really what is happening and that is what multi-threading is all about, okay. So, here is a little bit more example, let us not get into this, but if you really want to know how instruction execution happens within a, um, a sum, okay, you basically fetch one warp instructions per cycle, okay, from the instruction cache and this corresponds to all the 32 threads, you do the decoding and you also figure out whether this instruction is ready, data ready. If it is data ready, then only we consider that warp to be data ready. If it is not data ready, even for one of the many threads, then it is not data ready. So, you understand, right? So, all of these 32 threads in a warp can go only together because they all execute the same instruction. 
if one of the instructions, sorry, if one of the threads execute, so let, let's say that we have these 32 threads and all of them are executing the load instruction. For 31 of them, the load instruction is satisfied in your L1 cache. But for the last thread, right, let's say the data is not there in your L1 cache. It has to come from the memory. It doesn't matter. All of these 31 instructions will wait until the other fellow gets the data from the memory. Right? Again, you are, I'm assuming that this is not a wireless access. So the one thread is actually accessing data from elsewhere, and that is not there in my cache. So I have to go and get it from the main memory. It's going to take me hundreds of cycles. So, so essentially what's happening is that you have this 32 threads or 32 instructions, so to say, which is actually the same instruction for all of these threads. If one of them stalls, then everybody stalls. Okay, they all can go to the next instruction only together, right? That's a batch of threads going one instruction after another instruction. And that's really what is shown in this previous slide. When I say warp eight instruction level, all the 32 threads together execute warp level, sorry, instruction 11. And only when they complete, only when all of them complete, I can go to the next instruction. Even if one of them is not completing that instruction for whatever reason it is, it will hold. Typically, it is memory-related instructions. That's where you know different instructions can have different execution times. At least, threads, uh, different threads can have different execution time for the same instruction. Typically, it is that. Okay, we are also going to talk about branch divergence, which is another thing that we are going to come into. But for now, we will just only look at this. Okay, it's understood, right? So they all execute, all threads in a warp execute the same instruction, and they progress together. That, that's really what you want to understand from here. Okay, so issue one, ready to go warp instruction every cycle. As I mentioned earlier, fetch decode and then data readiness is being checked, okay? And only when it is ready to go, you pick one of those instructions, sorry, one of those warps and then execute that instruction, okay? And then you execute it in one of these floating point operations or integer uh, functional units. And then you kind of keep track of what this instruction is doing, how, much, how many cycles it will take to get the operands available, et cetera, that you maintain it in what is called a scoreboard. And that's essentially what, how you figure out uh, which warp is ready to go. Uh, since you have not seen uh, too much of scoreboarding, I will not go into this, okay? But go back and look at what is scoreboarding and how scoreboarding helps to determine how scoreboarding helps to determine whether um, this data dependency is satisfied or not. Has that not been done? I was very surprised. Has it not been done? No? Okay. So go back and look at it, and that's, that's a useful exercise to do. Okay. So here is some more uh, animation on the same thing. So as I was mentioning here, uh, let's say warp 8 instruction 11 is executing at time step uh, k then in the next cycle, you will see that uh, maybe warp one in section uh, 42 is executing, and then in the next cycle, sorry, and then in the next cycle, something else is executing. Okay, so this is uh, pictorially what is happening. You can see that warp one is executing, okay, and then uh, each one of these um, uh, white part is essentially um, long latency instructions. Okay, that means that at this point in time, um, let's say warp one, one of those instructions in that 32 threads, at least one of those instructions in that 32 thread has issued, right? Has issued, um, an, uh, uh, has issued an operation which requires a long time to satisfy, okay? And uh, actually this shows that at that point in time, you switch to the next warp. And then again, when warp two gets into one of those long latency operation, you switch to the next part and so on and so forth. But you could even do on a cycle by cycle basis. And all that, that this is assuming is that this only these long latency operations are shown here, right? Now, what is happening here is that as you can see that in this duration of time, when warp one is waiting for this operation to be complete, I'm executing some useful instructions from warp two, and then I'm executing some useful instructions from warp three, and then I'm executing some useful instructions from warp four, and maybe I wait a little bit more, and then again, 
my warp 1 instructions are ready and I am able to execute some parts of that together, right. That is really what is happening. By overlapping this um, execution from different warps, we are essentially masking the latency incurred by these instructions. That is really what is happening, yeah. Could I repeat it, okay, good. So, what is really happening here as is shown here is that warp 1 is executing some number of instructions. It comes into an instruction which requires a longer latency, maybe a memory operation. And uh, so, so what happens is that during that time maybe instructions from warp 2 and warp 2 are being executed and then when warp 2 hit gets into a long latency operation you go to warp 3 and similarly to warp 4 and by the time you know maybe warp 1's long latency operation has completed again you can go to warp 1 and so on and so forth. Okay, but actually speaking what happens is that on a cycle by cycle basis you kind of switch from one warp to the other, possibly can switch from one warp to the other and there are different warp scheduling methods, okay, some which do on every cycle, okay, which is what is called round robin. Some which will actually switch only when you hit a long latency operation, something like this which is what is called GTO, okay, greedy then voltest. Okay. There are different kinds of scheduling methods that people talk about. Okay. But essentially what you need to understand is that when I have these multiple warps, their instructions are executed in some interleaved order and I cannot necessarily guarantee which warp will finish first and which warp will finish later. I cannot guarantee. Yeah. The warp inside one thread block, will be consistent The warp inside one thread block? The thread block which are bearing one Right. Yeah. So, the scheduling happens inside the thread block? Within a thread block? No, not necessary. So, for example, warp 1 and warp 2 could be from thread block 1, warp 3 and warp 4, warp 3 could be from thread block, uh, yeah, could be from thread block 2, this could be from thread block 3, right, okay. But these are from the resident thread blocks. So, I mentioned, right, there are three thread blocks that are resident. So, these belong to some of those warps maybe the other warps are waiting, I have just shown some of them, right. Again there are some restrictions in terms of how many warps can be simultaneously resident which is basically determined by the number of uh, thread blocks which are resident, right. So, you, you try to schedule across these things, that is really what is happening. Okay, let us talk about two other things and then maybe we will stop with that. One is the branch divergence problem, okay, this is something that uh, you need to understand. So, Again, I am executing a sequence of instructions which is what is there in a thread, right. What happens if in this sequence of instruction there is a conditional branch, right. And when there is a conditional branch, all the threads will be executing this condition. Do they all need to be come up with the same evaluation? Do they all need to find out whether it is true or false? Not necessary, right. Different threads can possibly evaluate the condition in different differently, right. So, thread 1 may say it is true, thread 2 may say it is false, thread 3 may say it is false and so on and so forth. Then what happens? Who goes to the then part and who goes to the else part? Then what happens to your warp structure, right? That should be the question that you should have in your mind and uh, this diagram essentially explains that. So, I have a piece of code which I am executing, then I have a branch instruction. And then if the branch condition is true, then I want to go to path B. If the branch condition is false, I want to go to path A. That is basically some sequence of instructions here, some sequence of instructions there. And after these are executed, I want all threads to be executing this one, right. So, what happens? How does this get executed in the GPU? Because in the GPU, we said all 32 instructions in a warp execute the same instruction. Right. For example, let us say that this condition is to find out whether the th thread ID is odd or even. Right. If it is odd, it goes through this path. If it is even, it goes through that path or it executes that basic block. What does that mean? That means that all threads, all odd threads are going to execute instructions in this thread block and all even threads are going to execute instructions in this thread block. But they have to execute one after the other, correct? Because at any given time, from that particular warp I can only execute one instruction. I cannot execute one instruction for this and one instruction for that, right. 
So, how is that going to happen? So, this is pictorially what is happening. So, all of these threads come, they execute the branch instruction, the branch condition and then the branch condition says that these threads have to go through the else path and then after that these threads have to go through the then path, right. And then together they have to execute the block which is after that. So, how is this implemented in the GPU? Okay. During this part of computation, you can see that even though you may have 32 SIMD cores, only some of them are being used, right? the others are idle. And similarly, during this part of execution, only some of them are being executed, the others are idle. So, whenever you have a branch divergence, you lose some performance because not all 32 cores will be active. Right? The more of this you have, the more performance loss you will incur. Okay. Now, uh, this uh, goes into all kinds of details, let us not spend time on all of them, but essentially this is what that happens. When you are executing this instruction, right, um, you maintain some kind of a stack uh, in the GPU, which talks about what is called the reconvergence PC. The reconvergence PC is that whenever you have a branch, okay, the place where the then branch and the else branch will again meet. That is basically what is called a reconvergence point. That means that some threads will go through this, some threads will go through this path and then when they come here, they can again meet up and then together execute. Okay. But if you see, this itself is a control flow graph. So, start with some threads go this side, some threads may go that side. If all threads go this side, there is no problem. right? So, let us assume that initially all threads execute instruction A okay, and then let us say the condition is such that all the threads satisfy this. So, they go to the instructions in the next block and they all execute that instruction. And after they execute this instruction, you find out that you know uh, these threads have to go through this instruction sequence whereas, those threads have to go through the other instruction sequence. Then at this point in time, in your reconvergence stack, you essentially put the following information saying that your reconvergence point is E. When you come to this particular instruction, all threads have to reconverge, converge again, right? And uh, one is the then part, the other is the else part, and you store the PC values for the then part and the else part, right? Then you start executing from your top of the stack, which is probably the else part, and execute all the instructions there. So, that is what you do and the threads which have to participate in that execute those instructions. Subsequently, when they come to let us say this instruction, when you check the PC, you say that the PC is same as the reconvergence PC, you say okay, now I need to stop and I have to pop the stack. And once you pop the stack, you go to the other, the else part, correct? Then you start executing the else part and the threads which are involved in the else part will actually execute those instructions, while the threads which are involved in the then part will be idle. Okay? And when these complete all the instructions in the uh, else part, right, you are going to figure out that the next PC is actually equal, unto the equal to the reconvergence PC. Therefore, you are going to say, okay, now I need to stop and then pop the stack. And once you pop the stack, your next PC is E and all the threads together start executing this. So, this is essentially what is called branch divergence and because of branch divergence, you will incur some performance loss. Right? You can possibly see that uh, in some experiments. So, I am not going to go into that. Let me just try to talk about this is the last problem I am going to talk about and uh, this is what is called the warp divergence problem. Okay? Uh, question no okay so in the warp divergence uh, let's try to explain this okay let's assume that this is the code that i am going to execute it's a nested loop okay mm, this is what i'm going to do okay this me just okay let let let's see otherwise i'll i'll um, yeah, I actually wrote this as a nested loop, but then the diagram that I have shown is slightly different. Okay, let's let's just focus on this table alone. Don't worry about anything else for the time being. Okay, uh, please ignore the rest of the diagram because it may unnecessarily confuse you. 
Okay. So, here is the situation right I have three thread blocks okay, and uh, each thread block has three warps right and uh, in that three warps essentially what is happening is that it basically is executing a loop okay, and the condition is that threads 0 to 32 right the condition value is 5 threads um, 32 to 63 the condition value is 15 and threads 63 to 96 or whatever the condition value is 10. So, what does it mean? It means that this warp is going to execute some loop 5 times, this warp is going to execute some loop 15 times and this warp is going to execute some loop 10 times correct. So, each one of these warps now they all talk about the same code, they are the same code, but there is a loop and some are going to execute more number of times, some are going to execute less number of times. And in this particular problem I am assuming all threads in a warp go together that is no branch divergence, but there could be branch divergence also let us not worry about it in this example right. So, what does this mean when you have situation like this what does this mean and let us say I have particularly chosen an example in which in thread block 2 something else is happening, in thread block 3 something else is happening. Right. So, I will pictorially show what is the impact of this when you are trying to execute this in a GPU oh man okay. the animation is messed up. So, do not worry about it. Okay. Um, let us assume that in this GPU in an SM at any given point in time only one thread block can execute from this kernel okay, just for simplicity otherwise I have to draw too many things here. Okay. So, only one thread block can execute from a kernel. Right. And only when that thread block finishes, the next thread block can go into execution. Right. And in the first thread block, warp 1 has to complete 5 iterations, warp 2 has to complete 15 iterations, warp 3 has to complete 10 iterations. Right. So, they may take this much amount of time. When do you consider the thread block as having been completed? Only when all of these warps complete. That means that only at this point in time you can think that the thread block has finished execution and only when the thread block has finished execution I can bring in the next thread block because for this particular kernel the number of concurrent thread blocks that I can hold is only 1 correct. So, that means that I have to wait until here the giga thread scheduler has to wait until here until it puts the next thread block for this S sum and the next thread block this is what is happening right. Now, warp 1 has to execute 15 iterations, warp 2 has to execute 10 iterations and warp 3 has to execute okay, actually warp yeah warp 3 has to execute 5 iterations right. Again I should finish wait for the warp which will finish the last and until that time other warps may complete their execution, but I cannot bring in a new thread block right. A new thread block can only be brought after that and this is what is happening. So, if I assume the total execution time for this particular kernel it is actually the sum of this plus the sum of that plus the sum of that which is very large right, but this is exactly how the execution is going to happen in the GPU because thread blocks all warps in a thread blocks must complete before you say that the thread block is completed and only when a thread block is completed it can release its resources and only when it re releases all its physical resources the next thread block can come into execution. Of course, you can have something like a 3 or a 4 or whatever number of thread blocks together concurrently executing, but as soon as one of them finishes only the next thread block can come in because the maximum number of sorry the number of thread blocks that you can have as concurrently resident is limited by the amount of resources that they consume. Okay, I'll, I will stop here uh, I do not want to get into other things maybe I will just quickly skip and then go to the next slide um, right okay, maybe maybe at two more slides before we go. So, if you just want to know how the CPU and the GPU are connected to each other and why the CPU is uh, called the uh, device and the CPU is called the host is because typically you have the CPU and you have the CPU 
the CPU and the CPU motherboard and the CPU motherboard is connected to the GPU on the PCIe okay, interconnect interface. Okay. This is what we call as the discrete GPU. There are now versions which are available where you actually put all of these things together uh, what are called integrated uh, CPU GPU architectures. We will not talk about that, but this is typically how things are connected. And in the context of a CUDA program which uh, Lavanya is going to talk about, what happens is that you execute your C code in the CPU core and then before you launch a kernel in the GPU, what you do is that you possibly copy some part of the memory which is required for doing the kernel computation from the CPU through the PCI device into the GPU memory. Okay? Uh, and then you do the computation in the GPU and then to continue the com computation in the CPU, what you need to do is that you need to copy your result value from the GPU device memory through the PCI bus into your CPU. So that is something that we should not forget. So to before you launch a kernel, you have to copy the data and when the kernel execution is complete, you have to copy the result back into the memory. So those things need to be done. Okay? I think uh, okay, this is a slide which basically quickly talks about various research issues uh, uh, that people have been working on and GPUs for example talking about new warp and thread block scheduling methods, talking about improving cache efficiency, prefetching in thread blocks, memory management is a topic which Arka is working, memory management in GPU is a topic which Arka has been working. Uh, Lavanya I think works in programming languages and compilers for GPUs, my team also works on that. We are also interested in integrated heterogeneous architectures, shared resources, shared resource management and many of the other topics. So let me stop here and then hand over the mic to Lavanya.